personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Greetings and welcome to another installment of the Resistance Library podcast. I'm your host, Sam Jacobs. We are brought to you by Ammo.com. Today, I have a very special guest, um, the Brian Nichols Show host, Brian Nichols. I was, he was actually, the, I believe, maybe the first podcast I ever did. You were a very early one. I've been back on a couple of times. Um, I'm like, I, I don't know, I'm like your prickly conservative guest, <laughs> maybe. Is that uh, that well, works. Yeah, that, that's close. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm sure you use. Uh, I'm sure you use less polite language when discussing me, and uh, you know, uh, not in, in, in private company. Uh, but anyway, Brian is a gr- <laughs> Brian is a great guy um, with whom I have some like substantive disagreements on issues with, and I and I don't want to like. This is not. I'm not Ben Shapiro. We don't do debates here. This is about like. I want to give him an opportunity to answer my objections um, without it being some back and forth thing where I'm just t- shutting him down and telling him he's wrong. I just want to give him an opportunity to talk. So that's what this episode is going to be about. Uh, Brian is a pretty busy guy. He does lots of other stuff other than the Brian Nichols show. Uh, tell people where else, you know, what else you're kind of up to. <laughs> what else I'm kind of up to. Yeah. Uh, where to start. Uh, right. So beyond the program, um, I am the director of, of sales development for a telecommunications cybersecurity uh, master agent here on the East Coast. So what that may- basically means is that my company, we work with medium to large businesses, specifically those in the greater healthcare, finance, banking, uh, anything with regards to law, manufacturing, and really focusing on CIOs, IT directors, more or less your traditional IT executive. And what we're able to do is to help simplify the process of going out and having to source all of your telecom, all of your bandwidth, all of your advanced voice solutions, all of your cybersecurity infrastructure. There's dozens, if not, uh, you know, hundreds of providers who are out there and they can tell everyone they can do anything that you ask them to do, but only a handful can actually do that well. So What my company does is take that process that usually takes months of vetting and gives that time back to those professionals by reducing that time frame to, in some cases, as little as a few weeks. Um, So what I decided to do was to take my position, uh, which was, again, focusing on helping train my sales team here uh, for my, my day job and bring that to the Liberty world. So What we focus on the program is really top of mind issues that people are bringing to the table and answering those questions with real, practical, liberty based solutions that are going to hopefully not only answer those problems, but leave people in a better place than where they were when they started by solving those problems, but by actually helping bring them to a better uh, situation in the future. So that's kind of my role, not just uh, here in the greater Liberty world, but also in my, uh, my professional career. I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity before we get into kind of the meat of it to just talk a bit about what being a libertarian means to you and how you define that. I mean, it's the type of thing where like 50 different, you ask 50 different libertarians, they're going to give you 50 different answers. I don't want to get into some kind of straw man where we're putting this, you know, plastic middle of the road, um, kind of like gutless libertarianism that means nothing uh, and can mean anything. I want to know what it means specifically to you. I want you to define it for our uh, listeners. And this is the definition that we're going to use going forward, because I'm not going to make you defend somebody else's version of libertarianism. And I appreciate that, Sam, because and also this is this is for the little L libertarian, not the big L libertarian, um, which would be the the big uh, L libertarian political party. So when we're talking about libertarian, the ism, it really comes down to the idea of do you believe that you should not hurt people and do you believe that you should not take their stuff? And also with the understanding that with that, there are certain kind of ground rules among them being property rights. So 
who you are and what you own is yours, right? And if you work for something, it is something that you have earned. So I would say at the end of the day, if you find yourself nodding in agreement, and as long as we can agree on, you hear a lot of libertarians focus on the NAP, the non-aggression principle, but more so not necessarily the act of aggression, but rather just the fundamental understanding that we can go about our daily lives in making these transactional relationships every single day, just without even thinking about it, but because we see the mutual beneficial relationship that comes from those relationships and from those transactions. So that's what it means to be a libertarian for me. So this is an excellent segue into um, my last two questions, which I'm going to now make my first two questions. Um, my my question, and I and I and I and I think that that's like a great way to define it. Um, but my first kind of question, well, it was two questions when I wrote them down, but it's kind of one question. Um, can you practice this kind of can you can you practice this kind of political um, culture, you know, in a in a political entity, a social a social entity, um, with people who? Uh, you know, don't respect it. Don't agree with you. Just say, yeah, that's cool. I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to hurt you and take your stuff. Um, I mean, there's, there's, I think, uh, I, I think that there's, there's, there are people who make an argument and uh, I, I, I certainly have at times, but I, it's not the hill I'm going to die on. And I would love to hear your take on it. But specifically, I've heard people say, you know, that like communist uh, agitation is a form of aggression because they're basically saying they're going to, they're going to kill you and your kids and take all your stuff. Um, I think that that's a very extreme example, but the kind of the, the gist of what I want to ask is, you know, if, if, if you think that it's not okay to kill people and take their stuff, but I don't care, how do you live in a society with me together? So I think the difference would be the initiation of violence part. So libertarians, we don't believe in hurting people just for the sake of hurting people. We do believe, though, in if you need to defend yourself, if you need to defend your family, if you need to def defend your person, then you have that right. You have the ability to use force in retaliation to force being enacted upon you. And I think there is a lot of times where libertarians, they miss the mark in articulating that because we see the, the non-aggression principle too often than not lead the conversation. And it, it leads to a lot of questions. People say, well, well, let's go, what is aggression, right? And then you start to have really uh, these, these semantic battles. But at the end of the day, it's non-aggression in, in so far as not a, an aggression unless you're re in response to an act of aggression upon you. And that's where I think we would see no question asked. You know, if if there are those who are going out of their way to cause harm, then there are going to be. And this kind of goes why the market is so important, why you need to have this free market system to go along with this libertarian system is when you see the problems and and to your problem I think you're you're identifying here Sam is well what about these people who they don't care about principles. They really have no underlying guiding moral compass. What about them? I hear you. And I think you would see, and it, with the government getting out of the way, especially, you would see a market force where you would have people go out of their way to disassociate from those people and to have infrastructure in place to help hold those people back by use of force if necessary. Um, and we see that right now with countries. I mean, we, we in, I'm, I mean, look no further than Afghanistan with what's happening over there. Right. But you're going to see this type of mentality happen regardless, whether it's states doing it, whether it's it's private actors. But with private actors, at least there are now different forces at play. Now you no longer have that monopoly on violence. There's no one state determining what is good and bad at the behest of one ruler, the rule of a few, the rule of many. Does it matter at the end of the day? Um, I think that's where we would find maybe a little disagreement, but it's not a matter of my disagreeing in terms of people not being able to defend themselves, but just the means that we have right now 
I argue, and I would look at the the Constitution that they've already are uh, the Supreme Court's already ruled that there's no means that's in place for any law enforcement officer to actually go out of their way to protect you. That that's that's actually court law. So let's start to acknowledge that it's a broken system fundamentally, and let's start to find solutions. And that starts with. I again focusing on the free market, but also peeling back a lot of that red tape, or uh, in many cases, just the institutionalized monopolies that we have in the government infrastructures. I think that's I think that's really well said, and I think that that's an area of agreement that I have very strongly with libertarians. Is that I just don't like centralized power, like period. I don't care where it's centralized. I want you know twenty different poles of attraction. 200 different poles of attraction rather than just one. And I, I think that that's really, really well said. I think that your point about, you know, um, people who maybe are kind of new to this area who, who don't know, uh, I would encourage you to Google what Brian has said about the police do not, according to United States uh, statute or, um, you know, case law in the Supreme Court, do not have a obligation to protect you. They only have a obligation to enforce the law. Uh, under the laws of the United States, and I think that that's a very important thing to always remind people of. I believe it was on the uh, the uh, Peter Quinones show, uh, Peter Quinones episode. We talked about that. He is another libertarian who's very near and dear to my heart, uh, and I believe you guys know each other too. He's a cool guy. We talked a bit about that. You mentioned the free market, though, and I and and, um, and this was like a thing that we talked about on your first episode. Uh, the first episode I did with you on on your show, and that was oh, that was maybe two years ago now. So I'm sort of curious what you think about big tech censorship, and which I think is you know, as I think you know, to me is like the 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 issue of the day. Um, how how does libertarianism ensure an open marketplace of ideas where people can actually discuss things and and you know ensure that we don't have four, five, six tech companies deciding what the uh, band of acceptable opinion is. Mm -hmm. No, no, and your concern is valid, right? And this is something that you and I really dug into, to your point, a couple of years back. And uh, my sales guy, you know, solutions-based approach kind of is kicking in here, Sam, because we have to first reverse engineer. Well, how do we get here? How do, how do we have this existing solution in place where to your point, we have a few massive, ginormous corporations in this tech world, and they do have, in many cases, if not a monopoly, uh, an olig uh, oligopoly. Uh, so how did we get here? And if you look back, we had the most growth in the tech sector when? Back in the 90s, when you had the deregulation of the tech industry, and specifically you saw telecommunications companies start to boom because you had the advent of CLEX. So CLEX are basically companies that can look at the larger LEX, which is a local exchange carrier. Think of your, your old Verizons, AT&T, or you go way back, your Bell South, for example. And those companies would then have their services bought in, in, in bulk and sold essentially by these CLEX, which are separate entities that then could you know add on the bells and whistles, add on the the added value, the customer support, and also they can give more uh, cost effective, uh, uh, cost competitive pricing versus if the consumer were to go directly with this local exchange carrier. It also opened up the world of your non-let companies. Think of your Comcasts out there who started to just uh, put out this this dark fiber, which then turned into their network. And, and then they really started to uh, formalize this broadband infrastructure that was based on a, a pseudo fiber product here in the Northeast. So you saw this boom with that, but also the advent of the Internet. So all of a sudden you had more and more people being able to get connected faster than ever across the world. And we saw that you you have the ability to start to have more of these conversations. Heck, what we're doing right now, Sam, is a perfect example that weren't happening back prior to the 1990s. Not only were they not happening, but the gatekeepers in media were throttling what that conversation was. So what happened was all of a sudden these these large media corporations start to to see the writing on the wall that their traffic is now 
being uh, directed more towards these social media platforms and not to their channels, but to these independent media entities, your Joe Rogans of the world, the, the young Turks of the world. And all of a sudden they are now not only losing their market share, but they're losing control of the narrative. So what they start to do, they start to use their relationship being the corporate media with government to start to leverage government on regulating an industry they know nothing about. They know nothing. I mean, God, you want to feel just like, like the, you know, one of the smartest people in the world, just go ahead and watch some senile 70 some odd year old, uh, you know, boomer senator trying to to grill Mark Zuckerberg or, or you know, Jack Dorsey on the, the, the tech that they're actually trying to regulate. But what happens is these tech companies have this natural inclination to survive. So instead of dying at the hand of government, they have decided for their own survival to align with government. Why else would Mark Zuckerberg go out of his way to say, well, not only do we support you regulating us government, but maybe we'll help write the laws that you'll use to help regulate us. So there is a natural incentive that was in place to not only have the media push out these alternative forms of, of access to news, but also to start to consolidate how you're able to disseminate that information. And we see right now, 2021, Jen Psaki saying that Facebook is working directly with the White House on what is COVID disinformation, uh, which uh, it just seems to be whatever the CDC determines to be the science uh, this week. So we're seeing right now that we got to this point by a consolidation of power at behest of the federal government, not actually the free market, but rather when the free market was allowed to do what it does, and that is incentivize competition and to force companies to compete either to offer a better service or to offer lower prices, what happened? We had a boom. You had a massive boom there in the 90s for the internet. The dot-com bubble not only was a bubble from an economic standpoint, but it also helped blow things up from the tech standpoint to the extent now where we see essentially exponential growth in the technology as it advances here in 2021 every, uh, every few years. So I would say now, as the sales guy, offering the solution. Now we've seen to how we got here. It would be, we need to get government entirely out of determining what is considered to be good or not good speech, right? What is morally, you know, or I, I guess the, uh, it's almost like the, um, the, 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 uh, Puritans of, of yesteryear, only now they're controlling what is being said on the internet. And, and that has been the push. So instead of establishing more power over this technology in one entity being government, I actually say we need to start to encourage alternative forms of technology that cannot be regulated. So we're able to go out and put out information like the conversation we're having now, Sam, that doesn't go through some regulator that doesn't have to face, you know, the, the opposing uh, political or ideological views in some government bureaucratic organizations, thumbs up. I don't want that. I don't think you want that. And we see how quickly the government can switch from one side to the other with just going from Trump to Biden. So um, with all that being said, my solution to the problem of big tech censorship would be get government entirely out and allow the free market to, to flourish. We saw when there ha was, was an obvious curtailing of free speech with censoring on different platforms, that there were alternatives that popped up. And what happened? It was a collective effort by the other tech organizations at pressure by government to go ahead and squash those other organizations. It's on us to make sure that we're encouraging the alternatives to go ahead and create their solutions and then raise them up, show the value of what they're doing, the problems that they're solving, and how it's going to help us be able to have these conversations going into the future when you're going to see more and more the government is going to grip harder on the narratives. And the harder they grip, the more it's on us to make sure that we are presenting the solutions that people will need in order to stay in contact with one another. I think that that's really well said. 
Um, you know, I think that people oftentimes kind of ignore the part of the equation where there's not tons of light between the state and big tech at this point in time. Um, I mean, you're absolutely, I said this when I went on your show the first time that like wanting something to be done is not synonymous with just do anything. And I don't care how stupid it is. Um, but I think right. that I, 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 and what I really like is, you know, I think it's, it's a much stronger argument to say, look, we can look back and say nineties telecom boom, dot com boom, uh, the market exploded. It wasn't just the market exploded and everybody got tons of money. It's that the market exploded and there was 50 new companies. So if you didn't like the one that existed yesterday, you could go to the 49 new ones, uh, which I think is a, is a much more compelling argument than like, you know, just kind of assuring people that it will work out. So I'm glad that you have that kind of background to put that uh, in there. Now I'm going to switch to everyone's favorite topic, the military industrial complex that we all love so much. But the one thing that they do that I really like, um, and that I think it often gets neglected in discussions of, uh, militarism, internationalism, isolationism, these types of conversations is that the United States military is basically the police of the world's shipping lanes um, which I don't want to pay 20 bucks a gallon for gas because the shipping lanes are insecure or because they're controlled by Russia or China. Um, and, you know, or Somali pirates have just taken over the entire Indian ocean or anything like that. And, and, you know, I don't think anybody else does either. And if the gas prices go up to whatever they go up to, because, you know, somebody blocks the Strait of Hormuz with two, with two ships, which is about what it takes. Um, you know, what, what is the, um, response to that and how do we, and the, the price of everything will go up, you know, if the price of gas goes up because that's, that's everything. So kind of how do we, I mean, and this is a real problem. I don't think this is a, like, you know, fr frivolous concern of saying, let's, let's do deep cuts to the United States military. I have been against the war in Iraq from day one. Um, I have opposed, intervention in Afghanistan for the bulk of the last 20 years. Um, so I am by, by no means a, a hawk. Uh, but I do think that we live in a world full of uh, dangerous people, full of rivals, uh, you know, and that something, I hate to use the phrase, something needs to be done, but something needs to be done to ensure that goods can go from one place to another. And right now, the only people that are going to do that in a way that isn't going to mean that I'm personally going to be paying way more for everything else in the world is by having the United States Navy and the United States Air Force patrol the world's shipping lanes. Um, how do we, what's the replacement for that? How do we ensure that like goods can still travel throughout the world when there's not one gigantic military uh, making sure that they can do it? No, great question. Um, so looking at your concern i think there's two parts to it number one is the well what happens when these instances do happen in terms of the economics right when the disruptions take place but then also well what do we do in the event that this does happen right so i think the first thing to look at and this is going from my business continuity standpoint uh for my day job in you know looking at the long term that the, the, the bia the business impact analysis you're wanting to go out and figure out what are the worst case scenarios? So, it, you know, you if you're a shipping company, you have to know what are the worst case scenarios. Um, and and be, before we go to their solution, looking at the worst case scenario from a country standpoint, from the economics, I would say, well, that would be pretty much solved if you're looking at from an energy standpoint by getting rid of the red tape on nuclear energy and letting nuclear power just just flourish here in the United States. I did an entire episode uh, over my program with a gentleman who, uh, you know, nuclear uh, expert and and looking at now one of the main concerns was nuclear waste. What are we going to do with nuclear waste? Well, guess what? They can use nuclear waste now to make new nuclear energy that can power entire cities. So we're seeing the, the advancement in nuclear technology to a point now that a lot of the concerns that we saw originally from, you know, let, let's just use that as the example, an energy independent standpoint. We can have the answers readily available if we get government out of the way. But to your other question, and it goes back to, again, the worst case scenario, what would the worst case scenario be if you're a shipping company that your your ships do get attacked by pirates? 
there is an incentive in place to protect those ships. So if we were to have a situation where, you know, we were to say, okay, in Libertopia, there is no American military, there is no American, uh, you know, force that is it's overseeing that area, you would see more often than not the shipping companies having likely armed, uh, you know, armed escorts from some private contracted company that would go out of their way to service those respective areas. No different than what we would see with private security forces overseeing an event in, you know, in downtown Manhattan, for example. It would just be in a different type of mentality. And it would actually, I think, help increase the the likelihood of less externalities down the road because there would be the the need to make sure for these hired contractors to do things in a way that would reduce the amount of damage done if possible because they don't want the liability but also it would help increase and incentivize what technologies can we create to help stop this some you know let's just use the, the pirate example right what can we use to stop the pirates from going after these ships what technology can we develop and you're going to see more and more creative people the Elon Musks the Steve Jobs of the world taking on those questions as now they're empowered to start to solve them instead of having that focus consolidated in these you know kind of small hived areas now you're empowering people to become pow- uh, problem solvers and i think that not only will be rewarding from the advancement in terms of the technology but it'll also be rewarding in terms of of reducing the amount of burden as it pertains to defending these these different companies on the taxpayer. Instead, it will go towards those companies to defend themselves. And if the product is you know, deemed to be of value, so that needs to be protected, they will protect it. Or we will find alternatives. If it's oil that we're importing from foreign countries, and all of a sudden you see that there's constantly increases in attacks on these oil ships, well, guess what? Maybe it's time for us to stop using and relying on foreign oil. Maybe it's on us to start being more energy independent by utilizing the technologies that already exist like nuclear energy. So again, I think it goes back to looking at what is part of the problem and then what would the ultimate solution be? Now, is it ideal? Absolutely. And will my ideal solution ever get to uh, where I, I would love to see it? I don't know. But I would say the step in the right direction would be reducing the the focus of what the American military is supposed to be doing and instead empowering those companies to take over the authority and the ownership and responsibility of seeing through that their ships are protected and then increase that that incentive structure in place to prevent it from happening in the future. Does that make sense? No, it totally does. It totally does. Um, and I'm a huge fan of nuclear power. I'm not like a big green, the, the world's coming to an end guy, but I just don't see how we, you know, support 10 billion people with uh, any kind of standard of living uh, without nuclear power. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I think that, you know, making these companies kind of shoulder their own costs, I, I don't see any... Um, disagreement with that uh last question i have for you is kind of the other thing that's very near and dear to my heart and this is something that uh libertarian thinkers like murray rothbard and hans Hermann hoppy talk about and that is that the a stable society is a prerequisite for liberty uh in the opinion of me and them and some other thinkers i'm sure um and the building block of a stable society is the family. I think that there, I think that there is a sort of uh, necessary and unresolvable tension between what we might call big capital and the nuclear family. And I'm just sort of curious, you know, how you kind of resolve the need for a stable society and the emphasis on a free market, which is only concerned with profit, which I don't, I am not knocking people who are concerned with profit. I'm just saying there are other concerns in the world, like truth, beauty, family, uh, God, things like this, you know, so how do we, uh, protect the nuclear family and not, and, and prevent, you know, big money from kind of just making us all into these atomized, uh, worker slash consumer drones. 
No, no. I and so let's maybe look at the education standpoint first, because that might be the the most important area to start, right? How do you teach society? How do you teach kids what it means to be good? Well, right now, what we've done and the existing solution that we have embraced has been the focusing on using government to tell kids what is right and wrong, to to use government as not only the means of measuring what that is, but also the means of teaching what that is. So what I would say, and, and hey, look no further than what just happened over the past year and a half of why it's so important for parents to be involved in their kids' education. But think about how many parents have abdicated any responsibility from teaching their kids, or at least know, being involved, knowing what their kids are learning. They're not paying attention, They're and they feel they don't have to. Why? Because they're paying thousands of dollars taken from their paycheck every single week, not by, by uh, choice, or rather, in this case, I guess it'd be property tax, right? So at least one big fat check at the end of the year that they're paying to their, their you know respective school districts, and they assume that, well, I'm paying this much money and the teachers and the school district is getting this much money. Plus, you mean you want to talk about the the problem? If we were to say the free market would have us chasing dollars, well, man, dude, look no further than the teachers' unions. At what we have right now, that is nothing but a a you know glorified Ponzi scheme where you are essentially using taxpayer dollars to to ne negotiate against public teachers and vice versa. It's it's insanity. So. Who ends up losing the taxpayer regardless? Instead, if we were to remove the, the structure in place where kids are confined to a school based on their zip code, and instead parents were able to fund the students and not systems, let the dollars that they would instead give to their school district, let their kid bring that with them to the school that is going to solve the problems that they maybe need to focus on most, or a school is going to help them be more successful in the future. And then it's on the, the parents to take that responsibility back. We don't, we don't have a better society by deferring government to help us show us what it means to be good. It requires us to go out of our way and to live by example and us living by example is nothing more than the market working. Us living by example, so long as it's us al allowed to do so in a voluntary, free way, that is giving us the chance to show what are the right values. And guess what? This is insane. This should get you excited. Is We're seeing parents fighting back. I had on my show recently Tiffany Justice from Moms for Liberty. It's an 80-plus uh, lo uh, different location 26 state, uh, or I'm sorry, it's 86 chapters. There we go. 26 states of this spontaneous group of parents who are fighting back. They're, they're mad because they're seeing what is happening to their, their kids and they're looking for alternatives. And I think that's something that we should get excited about and we should be empowering, not instead of trying to, to use government to instill this idea of what is good and bad. Instead, Let's start living by example, showing people how it works. And we're already seeing that it's happening. Let's just keep that momentum going. Yeah. And I, I love how mad parents are right now. And I think that, like, I, I, I agree with everything that you're saying. All, uh, but, you know, a lot to think about is really kind of the, the takeaway from this for me, because these are the questions I had and these are the questions that I uh, wanted answered. And I'm glad that you came on to do it. I just wanted one quick thing before we go. Can you name either a example of a libertarian society that you look up to or an example from American history that in involves a massive rollback of federal power? I would say that the biggest rollback in federal power that we've seen in American history would be that of 1776, would it not? Where we, we basically said, sorry. We're not going to defer to some random person over thousands of miles in Europe who's a king, I guess. Uh, no, we're not going to do that. And instead, we're going to, you know, kind of do what we want because we're free, independent people who aren't identifying with anybody over in, in Great Britain. So I would look to the American Revolution despite what ended up happening, right? And, and this, is, this is where we have to separate intentions from outcomes. 
the intentions were beautiful, right? To create the the best, most free society known to mankind. And and guess what? They they did accomplish that, but they also, along the way, unintentionally created a system that incentivized a consolidation of power at a federal level, actually showing that the main concerns that were raised all the way back in the 1770s by our our framers and our founders, the anti-federalists were entirely validated. They were entirely proven correct. And I mean, they would be, if they were in today's political discourse, the libertarians, they, they would be the ones going to Young Americans for Liberty. You know, you'd have Thomas Jefferson speaking at Young Americans for Liberty, right? That That's the type of people that they would be. And, and that's something I think that we can look back to that mentality and understanding what it requires and also understanding the risks that come along with it. I think sometimes people over glorify the, the, the you know, they, they put this, uh, you know, rose colored mentality of the revolution. Like they, these, these, these men were putting their entire, not just lives, their families, their, their, their livelihoods, everything on the line in pursuit of what they thought was going to be a better system to help instill not just liberty, but overall the goal of happiness, right? That pursuit of happiness, that was the ultimate goal. And that's the goal of liberty. Liberty is a means to an end. It, it in itself is not the end. That's why our socialist friends, they don't necessarily need to have liberty in their own lives. They just need to have the ability, that liberty, to choose what they want to do. Same thing with our very religious friends. In some cases, our religious friends will choose to not have freedom, to not have liberty, because they feel compelled by a, a higher calling to hold themselves to a certain standard. So as long as you're able to finish your day feeling that you are on your pursuit of happiness because you're able to live your free life, much like the founding fathers and the framers were envisioning, then that would be the ideal society. That's where my vision would be, Sam. And I think we have enough people right now who are all aware and paying attention that we can get just enough people to start to do more, to start building more solutions. If one person can talk to one other person in their immediate circles and not just, you know, get them to say, hey, yeah, that's, you know, you're right. But rather to get them to say, yeah, that's right. Right. That's the difference. And get them to agree with you not based on just saying, yeah, I agree with you, but because now they're seeing a different way. If every single libertarian, let's just say, or liberty-oriented person were to, to have one other person join the ranks, just think of the movement that we could have here in America in changing the country back to the way the founders envisioned. That is a society that would be tolerant and accepting, but not one that is is passive and it rolls over one that uh, embraces the ideas of liberty and justice but also would stand up and stand against aggression that's the society that i would love to see my man brian nichols thanks so much for joining us on the resistance library podcast from ammo.com where can people find you on the internet absolutely find me brian nichols show.com uh, that'll bring you right to the website. You can go ahead, find me on social media at B Nichols Liberty. Twitter and Facebook are my primary locations. And also, if you want to get in touch with me, email Brian at Brian Nichols Show dot com. Sam, it was a blast, my friend. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on, man.